the thing I always have is that a lot of people uh, put videos on the internet. Uh, yeah, these are your rights and this is what you should and shouldn't do. And I'm like, have you talked to a lawyer who actually um, litigates self-defense cases, not just yeah. has, has a course about it in college, but who's actually in the trenches and knows what it's like? And like, uh, no. Like, okay, well, yeah. All right. So you read something somewhere on the internet and you're telling other people what to do because you yeah. read something on the internet. Yeah. I used to have a mug. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't survive the move from office to office, but it said, please don't confuse your Google search with my 30 years of experience, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I mean, and, and speaking of experience, uh, I mean, you've been a PI for 35 plus years. Um, March 13th, 1987. Damn. How, yeah, how did you get it was started? Friday the 13th. I remember it very well. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I, at the time I was boxing and kickboxing. And uh, one of my sparring partners told me that uh, his boss was a PI and was looking for guys to work for him. And I said, well, don't you have to go to school for that? He said, no, you, a lot of guys are retired cops. He said, but no, it's, you can learn the business. And I said, okay. And I went to work for this guy and he gave me a statement to take with no experience. And I had to serve somebody with papers in Long Island. I got lost. The guy swung at me when I served him with the divorce papers. It took me six hours to do what should have been done in three. And on the way back, I had a car accident. So I walked into my boss's office, dropped everything on his desk and said, nope, nope, and left. And he called me two days later and he said, you had a bad day. You know, you're a bright guy. You know, we talked a lot, at least give it a, a real shot. You know, um, I was kind of congested. I had to get you out there to do some work. I would have trained you a little better. Um, he said, give it a shot and at least do it till you find something else. And I did. And I realized quickly that I wanted to do that for a living. And in order to really learn the business, what I did was I began making relationships with other people with my boss's permission. And I would go along with them on cases in my spare time, even if I wasn't getting paid, because I felt if I wanted to do this for a living, I needed to learn how to do it. And flash forward, um, is it going to be 35 years, I think, in a few months? And um, or 36 years in a few months, I've in my career investigated 70 homicides. Um, I've done a lot of work for fortune 500 companies if you've seen it on the news in the last 20 years there's a chance i've you've seen three or four cases i've worked on and um in november of 2020 i ran the investigations for the amistad project which was looking into the presidential election here in the states so i've had a, a an interesting career and uh i enjoy my work and uh you know, so, so far anyway, and I'm too old at this point to do anything else, really. That's the problem. <laughs> if, if, you, if you look at, you know, everything that, that entails private investigations, what would be like some of the biggest myths that you would hope would die and never come back? I mean, if you can dispel some myths from the people's minds. Okay. From... Well, you see, the funny thing about that is, well, for the when for the most part, I... How do I say this? Um, there are different types of investigators. Uh, for the, a, a, a private investigator to simply classify him is a gatherer of information. But there's a lot of other work that's sort of attached to it. You know, I know guys that, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not critiquing anybody or or comparing apples and oranges. But there are guys that make a good living who do nothing but insurance cases where they follow around people that are hurt. No. Um, you know, it's oftentimes not like you see in the movies, but there are exceptions to that. You know, I've seen, I've been, I'm the guy that you come to when you got the white supremacists after you. Uh, I'm the guy that you come to when your kid ran away. You know, um, I'm not a superhero or anything like that. I'm not, I, I'm not Andrew. For, but there have been times where I've gone and gotten kids out of places where they shouldn't have been a couple of times before they were sold. Um, I've been shot at. I've never been shot. Um, I've gotten a couple of cuts and I've been in frequently involved in types of work where violence is, is prevalent. 
Um, which is why if you ask 95% of the PIs out there, oh, we don't need a gun, we don't need this, we don't need that, uh, or that doesn't happen. Well, actually, sometimes it does. It doesn't happen every day. Uh, but there are, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that people come to when they have a problem that's too much for them. Uh, or that they find out that, oh, the police can't keep a guard 24-7 outside of your house. Um, and I've had on the other side of me bad guys, organized crime figures in the United States government. Um, you know, very often I'm the person that's hired by an attorney to help my client in situations like that. And um, it gives me a slightly different perspective. It doesn't mean, by the way, that there, I wasn't spending a large time in my car sitting there staring at a house and nobody moved from the house. But I could tell you, Four months after that first day, I'm begging my boss, when are you going to put me on a surveillance? You know, you see it in the movies all the time. You follow somebody. It's a surveillance. I want to do that. You got me serving papers. And he said, finally, Father's Day weekend comes around. I'll never forget this. I'm the guy that's training me. We're at the Court of Claim, which is in the World Trade Center. He offers me chewing tobacco. Never had it. And I want to be cool. So, you know, 21 chewing tobacco, the elevator jumps and I swallow it. The intestinal distress was like somebody got married in my intestines to the wrong person. So I get back to the office, I'm green and I, I get sick in the bathroom and, and my boss says to me, I, hey, you got your surveillance this weekend. Like, oh, that's great. <laughs> and we had this guy who was an older man. I guess it's 1987. He's got to be long gone by now. He had to be in his mid to late 70s. And his daughter was afraid that he was getting dementia. So she wanted him to be followed. So Saturday came. I'm in a 1977 Dodge Aspen with the sun beating through the window. And the window won't roll down. And my stomach is still, I got Pepto-Bismol. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching the house for eight hours and nothing happens. You know, and we get a, I get a page. We didn't have phones back then. That's how old I am. I'm not as old as McYoung, but I'm old. <laughs> And um, I mean, you know, Mark McYoung, first issue of Black Belt Magazine was on a stone tablet. I don't want to say anything. Anyway, I um, boss pages me. I leave and I call him. He said, be back there in the morning. And, you know, I figured it was going to be the same thing. And most surveillances are like that. But this is me. And things happen when I'm involved. And the guy leaves his house at 7 30 in the morning and walks up from where he lived on little clove road to victory boulevard and he gets on a bus and i'm following the bus and it's not hard to follow a bus thank god he goes down to what we call bay street which is the business area where the ferry is that goes to manhattan he gets on another bus and he ends up in a bad neighborhood and he gets out of the bed off the bus and i'm i, I park my car and i'm following him sunday morning he's in a park and he pulls out a wad of cash and he starts counting his money. And then I pick up two guys in my peripheral and they're staring at it. And the Parks Department in New York City Parks has these old antiquated brick buildings where I guess the people that work in parks go. Nobody had, on a Sunday morning in June at, at like 7.30, so, or at least in a park that size. So I run over there and realizing what's happening. And I, I'm, I turn the, and I'm listening to them around the corner and they're going to mug my client. Well, I don't know what the hell to do. You know, they're going to mug my, I mean, it's not, you know, there's no manual. I, I assume that my client would not want us to let her father, her elderly father be mugged. And I still don't know why he was counting his, maybe he was a little demented. I don't know why he could have been there to pick up a hooker. I don't know. And I caught them just before he passed the building. And I hit one guy from behind hard. And I told the other guy, I'm going to do that to you if you don't leave. And he ran. And I caught, you know, I found a pay phone, called my boss because now I'm scared to death. And he laughs and he says, you know, John, in 40 years, I've never heard of this happening to anyone. Uh, he said, you're in for an interesting career. And it turns out he was right. I, I'm in for an interesting career. <laughs> and, uh, and thus we kept going from there. You know, I, I realized at one point um, the most important thing was to have, uh, especially with the type of work that I handle, the very best possible people to work for me. And I do have a talent. My greatest talent, I think, is picking out guys and, and, and women as well, guys and gals, um, 
that are very good at what they do. And we achieve better results that way. You know, uh, it's not cheap, but it's, the, it's the, you know, um, if you come to me and you say to me, I don't want to go to prison. Well, OK, I'll do the best I can, but it's going to cost money. You know, these are the kind of cases that I get. Um, it, it also gave me a, a broad view of the legal system, which I would never refer to as a justice system. Um, and it gives you an understanding of things. And, and by the way, I do believe that the system here in the States is one of the best in the world. But there are political prosecutions. There are people that are mentally ill who commit their crimes in whole or part due to that, that are incarcerated in prisons that shouldn't be there. Uh, there are genuinely decent people who screw up, who deserve a second chance. But I'll tell you this, the majority of the people that are in prison should be there. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. uh, I'm not a crusader as far as that goes. And I believe in due process. You know, it, a lot of people have asked me, how does your advocation against child predators exist with due process? Well, because I don't believe in guilt by accusation. Mm -hmm. You have to have, it has to be proven that you committed a crime. And it's, it sounds like an old cliche, but as soon as you get to the point where, well, he's guilty and you, well, who's going to be next that's guilty like that? And uh, the people that are driving, what, what has me concerned is the people that are driving change in the justice system or the, the legal system here are people that have no real firsthand knowledge as to how it works. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, so it's given, it's been an interesting career and it's given me um, a very in-depth, broad view of the system, yeah. which, again, you're kind of stuck with once you know it's there. You know, you can't go back. No. What, what would be an, a perfect client or a perfect case for you? Like, there's, there's a lot of problems, obviously, I assume, in your job. Like, you're like, oh, no, not this again. But what would be like, yes. okay, if you could pick, uh, it could be anything. Your, your, your choice. Good question. The perfect case for me is where the client can afford us and they let us do our job. I worked once for a Fortune 500 company. I can only give snippets of information about this because I, you see, in my state, by the way, um, there is no privilege between a private investigator and their client, which is why most of the time we're hired by the attorney. Now, the attorney has the privilege, and because we're an agent of the attorney, that privilege extends to us, yeah. so we can't talk about certain things. Um, we had this company. They got themselves into trouble. Not Nothing major, but it would affect negatively a huge deal that they were working on, and they needed help with it. And the first person that I dealt with had said to me, what do you need? And I told him. And I had a team of guys working across the country within a matter of a day. Um, we can't, we went through, oh God, we circled the world twice mileage wise. And in 14 days, we um, went through, I think, 38 different states all over the place. And we accomplished our goal. And there was actually a, another PI firm that was hired by uh, if you want to call it, if you want to be dramatic, an enemy of the company, a competitor who was trying to find out what was going on and sabotage the deal. And we prevented them from finding anything out. So we served our purpose extremely well. And we found, you know, that they were, they benefited by it. And there was an enormous deal, which was, went, was higher than the gross national product of some countries that was exchanged in this deal. And it was simply because they presented me with the problem. And I told them what we needed to do to take care of it. And they listened. Um, more often than not, people will land themselves in a jam. They will get themselves in the jam. They will hire me. And I know what I need to do, but they're trying to get me to do what they want me to do. Yeah. And at some point, I will say, listen, you're paying me. It's my job to tell you that you got yourself into this mess and what you're going to do is going to make it worse. Let me do my job. And they have the choice at that point. And if they listen to me, most of the time I'm going to be right. I have a much greater chance of being right than they do. Um, you know, it's like a divorce case. You have this horrible divorce, right? And you're, you're, yes, you are personally involved in this horrible divorce, but I've worked hundreds of them. Yeah. 
do you think I might have a little bit broader understanding of what's going to happen than you? And look, well, not always. Sometimes I'm wrong, but far more often than not, I know what needs to be done. I can't tell you the amount of times when where guys have paid us a lot of money to help them and they just don't listen. And at that point, <laughs> if you're intent on that, okay, the wire hit my account. All right. So let's do what you want. But I make them put in writing. I'm telling you not to do this. Yeah. And I've had them say, why did you, uh, you know, that email that you sent me, you want me to send it back to you. And, you know, the perfect client for me is someone that will listen and basically let us do our job. And that's not every client. And unfortunately, um, and I, you know, I, in the past, I mean, in, after the 2009 collapse in the, uh, in the States uh, with the housing uh, going down, um, my partner and I were going through our caseload. He's like, uh, you know, John, we got about 20 pro bono cases here. So we need to, we can't really do that, you know, um, because I, I tend to be the patron saint of lost causes. Or you see something, um, you know, which you say this is wrong and these people need help and you want to help them. And you should do that to an extent, I believe. But you can easily end up doing too much of that. Yeah. And if you're not making enough money yourself to survive, you, you're no good to anybody. Um, so it's, you have to try to balance those things. Um, I, I don't like certain types of people. I don't like people that abuse women or children or anybody for that matter. Um, you, you just have to approach the work. You can, be, you can do some good, but you also need to make a living. It's sometimes hard to balance that, um, which is why it's good I have partners. <laughs> um, well, obviously, I now have to ask the opposite of that question, but let, let's make it more interesting instead of just making it what would be the worst possible client or case. What if you could accumulate like a top three of worst things all combined in one case or one client? Lying to me. Okay. Sending me off in a direction. We did a homicide. I will tell you something, um, and this uh, no exaggeration. We did a homicide case where we proved not that the man was not guilty, but we proved someone else did the shooting. Yet my client lied to me all day. I never saw the murder weapon. He was with the guy that did the shooting. And the guy at one point handed him the murder weapon. And he spent six hours telling us after all these questions were asked, I didn't, I never, I didn't know he had a gun. Oh yeah. yeah. The day before he gave it to me. So, so uh, stop for a minute. Uh, you just told us, and I went through my notes about 80 times. You never saw the weapon until he pulled it out. And he's like, Oh, is that bad? Yeah. Shithead. Your prints are on the gun. And we actually found a witness that proved he didn't do it. And you'll yeah. outside of a movie, I doubt you will find another PI that that uh, can say that. Well, he saw the actual shooter. Yeah. Um, and once we did that and gave the information to the attorney, the son of a bitch fired both of us. And let's <laughs> so yeah, that that's not a good client. And you know, by the way, you're working, and again, you work for some people. Look, it's not uh, if you you can't say, I believe in due process when it's convenient for you. Yeah. The translation to that is there are people that I have worked for that I have despised where I know, you know, that they've done it. I mean, there are conditions with me when I go to work for people. I've also worked for people that were wrongfully arrested. There's not a lot of those, but they exist. And I've worked for people where it's somewhere in the middle. But if you, if you, um, there was a shooting on television. Uh, it was a shooting that was being reported about on the news and I was at home watching it and it was a cop and he had raised his four daughters by himself. By the way, I'm very pro cop myself because I know, by the way, what happens when there's no cops. A lot of people have asked me, I've never been a police officer, but I know criminals. And if there's no cops, you better make friends with those criminals. Uh, you know, uh, the defund the police nonsense that I see, it's, it's again, it's being fueled by people that don't have an understanding of what oh, actually is don't, don't get me started. It, it's, 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 it's insane. You know, um, so I'm watching this on television and the guy's four daughters are being interviewed and they're crying. The father was just murdered. He walked in on a drug deal and the guy blew his brains out. It was probably an accident 
he walked in on a drug deal, not knowing it was there. They weren't prepared for him. There was a reaction. The guy shot him. Okay. Um, and they caught him. And I'm like, oh, God, am I happy this is not my case? And then they pan to the courtroom and I see the attorney that is sitting with this guy. And his name is Jim Koenig. Uh, Jim is sadly no longer with us, but he was a great guy, great lawyer. And I'm, I went, uh oh. And the person's watching me said, what? And I said, that's Jim Koenig. And as I said, that's Jim Koenig, my phone started ringing. I'm like, oh, God, no. And I picked up the phone. It's like, hello, Jim? And it was Jim Koenig. And I said, oh, my Jim, I'm watching you on television. He goes, I need you for this. I said, Jim, for God's sakes, I'm looking at his daughters cry here. And he said, I know, John, it's bad. I said, did he kill him? He goes, yeah, he killed him. He blew his brain. I was like, oh, my God. You know, how do I do this? You know, I, I mean, I'm watching this. I, I can't get the image of his four kids crying out of my head, you know. And I said, Jimmy, all right, I'll call, I'll call you back. And all these horrible things are running through my head. You know, I'm going to lose every police contact. I'm trying to look for an excuse. I get one. The guy is indigent. He doesn't have money for a lawyer. He's going to get what we call a 13B, a publicly, a private lawyer who's paid by the public because legal aid is jammed. And I called Jim back. You know, Jim, I'm not on the 18B panel. He's like, the judge will put you on. I already talked to him. I was like, okay, I'll call you back. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I, I got to find a way out of this. And the phone rings and it's another attorney named Pat Brackley, one of the best criminal attorneys I've ever worked with. Uh, he made the Saul Goodman character look like an idiot. <laughs> um, he's got, and the funny thing about Pat is he's a great way to work with. He might not even remember your name once he meets you, but he'll still get you a not guilty verdict. You know, his, his mind is works in weird ways. And um, he, he said, you know, we're talking and he gave me a case and he said, what's the matter with you? I said, and I told him and he was quiet for a minute. And he said, so you don't have the stomach to defend this guy. And I was like, he killed this guy. Pat. He goes, John, most of the people we represent are guilty. Do you believe that bullshit that you're constantly spewing about due process? I said, of course, I believe it being now insulted. He goes, then do your fucking job. And I thought about that for a minute. And I said, God damn it. I got to do the case. <laughs> and I called Jim back and said, I'd take the case. Thank God. There was nothing I really had to do. Yeah. He settled the case like in two minutes with the, you know, the guy was never getting out of prison. He admitted to what he did. And that was it. But that's the thing about the work, you know, um, I'd rather in retrospect, though, work for a guy that's done wrong than a guy that's lying to me uh, because yeah. they send us off on all different kinds of wild goose chases. Or the people that say they're hiring me for one reason and it turns out to be another. I can usually figure those people out in the beginning, but once in a while, someone will slip through. You know, the guy that hires me because his elderly father is marrying a waitress and she's stealing all his money. Oh, so you look into it and you find out they actually really love each other. This woman worked three jobs as a waitress to put her son through medical school. She's never even gotten a parking ticket. And they, according to everybody that doesn't realize they're talking to me as a PI, they think I'm some, some guy. Uh, they're all telling me the honest truth is that they love each other and you watch them and, and they really are a great couple. And I told well, the, the guy in, hey, hey, I, hey, I got good news for you. Except I didn't realize what he was hiring me for was he didn't want his inheritance walking away. He wanted to, he wanted me to find something so I could have his father committed. And I'm like, your father's lucid. There's nothing wrong with him. He loves this woman and she loves him. What good did you do? If you told me what you wanted, I might've explained to you in the beginning, but you know, people sometimes hide their motives. Uh, yeah. So yeah. ask them a lot of questions. And you, by the way, I don't know. It would depend upon the situation, but I believe not just legally, but ethically, we are obligated to find out why they're doing this. You, yeah. I've been used by stalkers before. You catch on to that real quick and then you, you, you don't work for people like that. You know, uh, my yeah. old boss, my first boss, the guy I told you about, great guy, cheapest guy I ever met, but I love him. He was a great guy. Um, we were asked to find this girl. I, had brought him somebody that he hired and I was working the case with this guy and a good friend of mine. And we, we found where this girl was staying. And it turns out that she was Arabic. The family was from the Middle East and it was an arranged marriage. 
And once we found out, I went back to my boss and I told him, I said, I don't think it's right that we give her up. And he said, we're not going to give her up. And that was what, you know, that's what you do. And he gave them back their money and said, we couldn't find. Her. And um, I still remember her name and how that worked out. You know, um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting as far as that stuff goes with your clients. You, you meet some interesting people there. <laughs> to put it in mind. Uh, Russian guy uh, came over here, cleaned as a janitor and eventually bought these medical buildings. I don't know what he was over there. And he had three of what we call no fault mills, your higher chiropractors and physical therapists and people have car accidents, whether they're hurt or not, they go there and they generate reports and stuff like that. And um, it turns out this guy had done some things he ought not to have. And in investigating him, uh, the attorney said to me, if they arrest him, he'll never see light of day as a free man again. And he was this little old chubby guy with these kind of weird glasses made him look like a grandfatherly frog. He had a little pot belly and very nice smile about, it, you know, like you're talking to your grandfather. And I realized that, you know, and then I said, well, what about making a deal with the police? And at that point, I realized he was Russian mob. Because the hardness that came over him, it was like he, he and he was like, no. And they were translating for him up until that point. And he looked me dead in the eye and he goes, no, police. And this now I don't agree with what he might have done or what he was accused of doing. But you have to admire somebody like that who would actually go to prison on principle. You know, you have to at least give him that. He might not be a good, you know, it, it goes, uh, might not be a good person, but he certainly uh, deserves respect for that because a lot of people would just cave. You know, it's yeah. a big, everybody says, that's another thing I've heard a lot. When, if I was charged with a crime and I didn't do it, I would never plead guilty. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's people who have no idea how it's, how the system works. There are people that would not do that, but let me tell you something. When the federal government throws its full weight on you and you get hit with 25 charges for the same offense where you could beat 23 of them, but still go to jail for 20 years if they tag you and you got three little kids and a wife and a life and they come up to you and say three and a half years and plea out. My, one of my partners is Bernie Carrick. He was um, the police commissioner of the city of New York at one point. And a lot of people love him. A lot of people don't like him. I knew Bernie from watching the towers come down on television and being grief stricken and seeing Bernie Carrick as the person who brought comfort to me and millions of other people. And basically Bernie's prosecution, and I've read for people that say different, I read the fucking trial transcripts myself. There were things that were done in there that would get lawyers disbarred. Uh -huh. uh, things that would have had complaints against the judge. If you read his first book, he talks about it. Um, he, was, he was thrown into a meat grinder because he was with Giuliani and Giuliani was running for president. He paid a maid in cash, which he admitted to. And some guys remodeled his apartment, didn't tell him what it was going to cost and undercharged him. He was found innocent on state charges and then found guilty on federal. He didn't, wasn't found guilty. At some point, his lawyer was going to have to be replaced because I believe for some, some reason, the judge said, you're going to need a new lawyer. He wasn't a billionaire. He gave all the money he had to this attorney. He just couldn't do it anymore. He was on trial. His whole life was in crumbles. And, and he looked at it and said, what, what are they going to give me? Eight months, plead guilty. And they put him away for five years. And, you know, again, a lot of people don't like him. All right. It's, it's your opinion if you don't like him. But I read the actual trial transcript and I know what he did. He, a man that, that has done those things does not deserve to have his life destroyed because your, his political opponents had the ability to do so. That's a problem for me. And if you're one of these people that runs around screaming, the system needs to be changed. And you don't think that needs to be changed. You're full of shit. You basically want your side to get control. You want to get, 
you want to get in there and you want to start doing some damage. That's what you want. I can't, I mean, how many times do you see a police shooting? I've worked on cases, homicides, high profile cases where I'm not immediately at the crime scene, but on a few occasions I've been engaged almost say within 12 hours. I know significant details of the case and I read newspaper articles about it. And I can't help but saying, what case are they writing about? Because it's not the one I'm writing about. Well, you're protesting cops because of a shooting, but the bodies aren't cold and nobody knows what happens yet. Yeah. That's a recipe for disaster. And people don't understand that. Um, the criminal class in this country has two components, amateurs and professionals. Professionals treat it like a job. They don't go out of their way to hurt civilians. Their goal is to make money. The cops say, put your hands up, whatever you, whatever you say, officer. They don't resist. They don't add to their charges. The people that fight, who, who's stupid enough to fight a cop? You know, you're fighting a guy with a gun and a stick that's got this little box where he can call like 20 other guys that got guns and sticks. It's not a sound strategy. You know, that's the place where you want to go. And, you know, I remember being a kid and being told by my father, you're getting up there in age and you're getting more responsibility. So I'm going to tell you, um, don't ever let the police call me. He said, and I said, well, you know, we, we talk about it. He said, listen, if you're wrong, that's one thing. He said, if you get arrested for something you didn't do, you tell me you're my son and we'll, we'll figure it out. But you don't fight with the cops. You shut your mouth and you say, yes, and that's what you do. Yeah. You know, uh, people just don't get that. Or they, you know, I don't have to obey a non-lawful order. <laughs> Good luck with it's, that. It's nonsense. You don't even know what a lawful order is. Most of yeah. the people, they have no idea what, what. Yes. I just posted something on, on my Facebook page. Uh, um, it's about police, something about a stolen backpack. They find with a geotagging chip, they find it. it's in a house somewhere. Police show up. This guy looks like he's, he's smoking weed. He's not really there. Um, um, the police want to come in and, and just can we take a look? Uh, and then his sister or something comes up. She starts yelling, creating a scene, this and that, motherfucker this and asshole that, and you have no right, blah, blah, blah. I know my rights. Long story short, it takes about 10 minutes before they put her in handcuffs inside the car, in, yeah. in, in which she doesn't seem to realize that A, everything is filmed with, uh, with the cameras that they have on. But also there's cameras inside the car. She is threatening one of the officer's wives and children. Uh, she's talking about, you know, you better, you know, watch out when I have my gun on me and this and that. Yeah, that's and, a good thing to do. And, and then yeah, that's that's a great that's a great thing to do. Five minutes later, the cop is driving her down to the station and, and he says, you know, yeah, you, this is gonna add be added to your charge. She threatened my my, my wife, she threatened my family. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you didn't. And I never said anything like that. I'm like, you know, this is recorded. I mean, you you can talk a whole lot of smack if you like, but that's not how it works. And and just like you said, this is an amateur move. The professionals yes. know that being arrested is going to be part of the job, and yes. they know how to handle it. They have uh, the right they have a lawyer waiting. Retainer. Yeah, so it's for the life of me, people who don't have all these resources and the experience to, to have them ready before they need them and so on. Um, they, they don't even know where to start when it happens. For the life of me, I don't understand, can you not be so blinded by your own outrage or whatever it is that you're getting yourself into a, a mess that you won't be able to get out of? It's not going to work. You're going to have charges. You're going to be prosecuted. If you, if you fuck up real bad, you're going to have a record. And this is going to mess up your life forever. Yes. And by the same token, on the other side, when I tell people, what do I say to the cops? Not a fucking word. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 but it was self-defense. Oh, All right. So, and we, our mutual friend, Mick Young, has made a career out of that. Um, just because you say it was self-defense doesn't necessarily mean the law is going to see it as self-defense because you know what? Most of the time, statistically, a self-defense case fails. What you do, and I tell people this all the time, and I have more experience than most. Officer, I'm sorry. I know you have a job to do. Please believe me, it's nothing personal, but I'm so upset. I'm, I, I don't trust myself. I'm going to wait to speak to my attorney. I mean, you know, disrespect. Yeah. And shut 
your mouth. There was a great scene in uh, Better Call Saul where the cops were going to interview Mike. I don't know if you ever watched the series. I'm, I'm, in, in, I'm halfway through season three. Okay. Mike is one of the greatest characters Long. ever. I, I know guys like my whoever whoever wrote that guy knew people. Uh, and they they caught every time the cops question him, he goes, lawyer. Yeah, but Mike, we don't need lawyer. <laughs> lawyer. And you keep that's it. Okay. And they're not going to take it personal. And if they do, then you definitely didn't want to be talking to them. Um, you know, that's how it goes. And there's a something I'll mention. Uh, I, I know you have a lot of people that follow you in the States and I'm going to, I'm going to say this, this nonsense with the defund the police and it's accompanying actions. I'm going to tell you what's happened. The cops are retiring as fast as they can. And the incidents that I'm seeing now where the cops, let me tell you, if you ask me this question five years ago, how often are the cops wrong? Less than 5% of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's because they get tunnel vision. And that happens to the best of us. That number is getting higher because there are far less experienced cops out there. Yeah. And they don't have the right guys training. And the number of wrongful arrests, in my opinion, are growing higher. So this movement, which firstly, factually, statistically resulted in 5,000 more dead from violent crime in this country in one year, um, not only, and many of them children, but who cares if you get to have your viewpoints out there and you get to, 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 to riot and protest, uh, who cares about the kids that die in the drive-bys? It's having a negative effect in that the quality of policing is going to go down. And that's unfortunate. You're, you're claiming this movement is going to help people. It's not. And I'm not saying, look, Personally, I, trend, I tend towards conservatism, especially fiscally. But I also believe in things like rehabilitation, especially with children. Um, no matter how heinous the act is, if it's a child committing it, odds are that's an abused child and you should make an effort to rescue that child. By the yeah. same token, punishment should be involved. Yeah. Now, I've, I've seen these geniuses. I, you know, there was a girl. Um, her name is escaping me, but... It's an actual case. You could Google the facts and come up with it, I'm sure. She was sold when she was six, and she was a, a, a sex slave. We do not refer to them as uh, child prostitutes. That's incorrect because it implies consent. They are prostituted children. Language is important. At 16, after being a sex worker for how many years, she blew this guy's brains out that paid to rape her. And I see these father's rights activists she should go to jail for the rest of her life she so you have a 16 year old and I, I apologize to your younger listeners but i'm sorry i was if you're 16 you're basically a horny idiot you don't know you, you know you don't have a fully developed moral compass do you expect a child that's been horrifically abused for 10 years to have any kind of normally developed moral compass no should punishment be part of it? Yes, but maybe try to see to it that you help that child because she was, if not, she's being ruined by the system twice. And by the way, my sympathies are not with the guy that paid to rape a child. Sorry, you know, you got what you, pay, you, got what you paid for. You know, you, you should have done that. Um, you know, even something horrific, you had that Central Park rape. First of all, those people are not innocent. The people that were, they, they were not, found to be innocent, their sentences were commuted. They did the rape. They did take the cops out there and show them what happened, okay? Now, by the same token, if you have a 16-year-old that is out there savaging people like that, you cannot tell me that kid lives in a stable environment. I don't believe it, not for a second, all right? All of these cases where they have these people and nothing, no, there's always some kind of abuse if you look deeply enough. One of Andrew Vax's greatest contributions to our understanding of child protection is that for 10 years, he ran a violent youth correctional facility. All of the children that were in this prison were, had hurt people to get there. And what he found over that 10 years was every single child that had no compunction about hurting people 
or derive pleasure from it. Every one of them had abuse in their background. You can't throw that away. Now, there are certain genetic components. No child is born bad. That's bullshit. People scream fascist, but claiming a child is born bad because of something, sex, race, anything. Claiming a child is born bad is wrong. There are certain rare genetic conditions which might propel a child in that direction, but you still need abuse as the catalyst. Um, you have to try to make an attempt to save these kids. And if it's an adult and the adult wants to rehabilitate themselves, they should be afforded that opportunity because you know what? Sooner or later, they're going to get out and they're going to be among us. So I'm not a bleeding heart. I mean, you do a crime like that, you should be punished, but you should also have the chance to make yourself better. And you don't really get that here. Um, You know, if we were smart, what I've learned about this system from observation, if we were smart, we would emphasize crimes against children and not the war on drugs. Because no matter what you do, no matter how you try, you're never going to stop drugs from coming into this country. You could decrease it. But back in the 80s, um, I remember meeting a guy who was in the FBI. He was in this huge joint task force, FBI, DEA, uh, Port Authority cops. And they worked at a Kennedy airport and they had just gotten something like a $46 million Coke bust or something like that. And I was having lunch with the guy and he basically said, yeah, it's all bullshit. And I was kind of shocked to hear him say that. And he said, I don't understand. And he said, for everyone that's on the news, there were 20 that get bias. Yeah. You know, and meanwhile, we have kids back in the 80s. We had Lisa Steinberg, this beautiful child who was illegally adopted by this man, and beaten to death as she was chained to a radiator. And there was going to be change. And the change was the Bureau of Child Welfare became the administration of children's services. And you could pick up last month and uh, the newspapers and find a headline. There was another kid that was beaten to death. So it happens so often now we are immune to it almost. Hmm. If you want to, if we could seriously improve our child protection, you would see a, a reduction of crime in 10 years, violent crime. Not every criminal has child abuse in their background. And certainly not everybody that's abused goes out and hurts people. But it happens often enough, and it's either the primary or secondary cause, that we need to do something about. And we don't. We say uh, we've had presidential elections. We've had countrywide elections the last couple of years. No one ever talks about child protection. No. And, and, and this is something that Andrew Vax, uh, and, you know, we should talk about him. Uh, Andrew Vax talked about a lot is that, you know, children don't have a lobby. There's nobody advocating for There's them in not. Washington because otherwise the, you know, legal protection um, and legislation to protect them would, would be passed, but it's not happening. And a lot of people like to talk about children are the future and they're important, this and that. Yeah. But, you know, put your money where your mouth is and make some changes and it's, it's not happening. So, no. could, could, I mean, Andrew Vax, um, how to describe him? Uh, a lawyer, activist, author, um, many things, a mentor yeah. to you. Um, sadly, he passed away. He is sorely missed. Um, one of the people who, who's writing, I think, is... Obviously, it's fiction, but then again, based on reality um, and very, very hard hitting. I've talked to to people yeah. about this uh, that they ask uh, sometimes, you know, what it's really like, or criminals, or the really darker sides of society. And I'm like, look, pick up a book by Andrew Vax, see how you like it, uh, and if you've got the stomach for it, read the rest of his work, and yeah. then read some interviews. With him. He he wrote a book. Um, I, we Andrew, um, I met him back in the nineties, and I met him at family court, and we got to be friendly online around 2013, and around 2015 we got to be close enough that we would call each other, and I had the benefit of him mentoring me with both my writing and child protection, and we spoke an average of about once a week, maybe an hour for maybe close to seven years. And I'll tell you this, the one thing, um, I, I mean, 
it, it's it's a hard one losing Andrew, you know. Um, he was a very influential person. And I, st no, okay. I still can't. You know, it's been a year, and I still can't uh, talk about him without getting upset. Um, he and I, I and if you look at the people I work with, this is not an exaggeration. Andrew was the smartest, most logical man I've ever known, and he took that intellect and objectively applied it to child protection for fifty years. Um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you something about Andrew. Uh, I didn't talk about this for, for a very long time when, without going into detail that would keep us talking for hours, I, I took in my niece, my nephew, and my sister-in-law, and I protected them from my brother. He's not a good person. And that was probably the easiest decision I've ever made. It was him or the kids. It was also the worst decision I've ever made because that's still my brother. My, a lot of times I'd gotten grief with my family because they love him. I understand that, but what he's doing hurt them. And it's not something you can allow. And eventually he went to prison for it. Not a pleasant thing. Uh, I used to, though, think if I had business cards printed up that said, if I put my brother in jail, just think what I would do for you if you paid me. Um, there was, uh, during the pandemic, we're watching this show called bloodline and it's basically the curly family in key west florida <laughs> it was it was amazing you have the good brother and i don't consider myself to be by the way um, and you have the younger brother who was horrifically abused and he leaves and comes back in their lives as an adult and he's wreaking havoc and his the two brothers are spiraling to this point where something really bad is going to happen and I, i'm watching this show and there comes a point where the brother, the good brother, for lack of a better word, goes to see his mother, who's played by Sissy Spacey. And she's begging him to help his brother. But he knows you can't help this guy. Mothers love their children, and it should be that way, but, and they will never give up. But you cannot help a sociopath. They, it is not a mental illness. It is a personality disorder. They choose to be what they are. It's that simple. It's evil. And there might be a reason for it, but I don't buy that. You know, you make that choice. And there comes a point where after the brother speaks to the mother, he gets into his car and he looks in the rear view mirror and sitting behind him is his brother, but as a child. And he turns around and he erupts, fuck you, at the top of his lungs. And I'm sitting there watching that and I'm remembering what that happened to my brother. I would see him as a child. And he was a great little kid. When he, I see this beautiful little boy who looked like somebody put a bowl on his head and cut around it with this goofy smile on his face. And that was my brother. And I see that, but that's not what he is anymore. And as much as I want that to be, it, it's not. And it was him or the kids. And after seeing this, and I'm sure you have learned in a short period of time, I'm somewhat verbose. After seeing this show, I, I couldn't talk. For two days, I called Mac. I called Clint. I, all these guys that I knew, and I'm like, I can't. All of a sudden, ten years later, I'm having this trauma over this. And finally, out of desperation, I called Andrew. And my father, getting ahead of it, falls into the category of a person who grievously but unintentionally was abusive to his children like that man that was dragging the kid out to make him fight like that yeah. my brother had a stutter and my father telling him don't fucking talk to me until you can talk to me like a man it's not what you say to a four-year-old's got a stutter and emotional abuse is as bad as the other forms and often disregarded you tell a kid things like that it does bad things and my father thought he was trying to help my brother you know um so andrew had said to me why was he saying fuck you to the brother i said well that's easy Andrew. It's fuck you for being what you are and most of all fuck you for making me do what i have to do and 
he said, you're leaving one out. He said, I know you loved your father, but what about the fuck you for your father abusing him? That may, He said, your brother does what he does out of choice. It's his fault. But who made him that way? And I said, my father. He goes, there's no fuck you for your father. And he said, what else? And I said, I don't know, Andrew. I actually got to the point where I thought I might end up killing my own brother. What do you think about that? And he goes, what would you think about a man who stood by and watched him do what he did and didn't intervene? And I said, I guess I wouldn't think much of a guy like that. And he goes, well, I wouldn't. He said, you know what your problem is, John? And he, the good thing about Andrew was whenever I had a fucking problem, he got it like that. He said, men like you have this feeling. He said, when you lost your father, when your father died, which was the open catalyst that made my brother go the way that he did, um, you believe that at, what was it, 13 or 14, you were able to deal with that grief and that pain and turn your brother from a path he set himself on as he got older when everybody that knew him couldn't do it and you blame yourself. And I said, yeah. And he goes, don't you see that's insane? And I, I thought about it. And I said, I guess it is insane. And it's like I felt the weight that I didn't know I was carrying that was very heavy being lifted. And I said to him, you know, I used to call him Papa, you know, because uh, to me, he was the Hemingway of, uh, of, of crime fiction. Also, he was a father figure, which you wouldn't figure happened to a man my age, but it did. And he said, I said, Papa, you will put all of therapists out of business if you keep <laughs> doing this. And he said, it's not that. Simple. He said, I've been doing this for 50 years, not the first time I've seen it. You know, that was who he was to me. You know, um, we would talk about writing. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this stuff is everything he wrote about child protection, sensible, reasonable ways we could fix this problem is on his website to this day. It's yeah. in all of his books. Um, there's nothing that he said that was different to me than what he wrote about. I made the mistake of asking him things. Um, and you would hear if he ever told you about his actual experiences, it's worse than what was in the books. Um, and we all suffered a, a huge loss with him being gone. Um, part of, uh, he never asked me for a damn thing. Never. I mean, uh, the first, he actually asked me to do a job once, and I was like a school kid, you know? Andrew Vax is asking me to do a job, you know, <laughs> that's so cool. So I do the job and I give him the information and he said, what do I send a check? I said, yeah. All right. When uh, you bill me for the, the writing lessons, then I'll bill you for this. And he said, fair enough. And we were just talking and we'd known, known each other about six months. And, you know, Andrew used to work out like a fiend. And I, I said, and I'm, I'm in my basement. I said to myself, I'm going to get Andrew Vax to laugh. And by the way, Andrew had a great sense of humor. He just didn't present it all. And I said, Andrew, do you know what the captains of Crush are? He said, I have no idea. He talked like Batman. I said, they're these industrial strength hand grips. And I said, I can close the number two eight times. It takes 190 pounds of pressure to do it. I can almost close the three with my right hand but I don't think I'll ever get it. And that takes 270 pounds of pressure. I said, you know why I do that, Andrew? And he goes, I would imagine some martial arts technique where you rip out someone's throat. And I said, no, it's because I'm cheap. And he said, explain. I refuse <laughs> to leave the last little bit of toothpaste in that tube. So I will <laughs> make sure. And he laughed for about a minute. And he just, he, I mean, he laughed. And then when I tried to say something, he said, wait, you got to give me a minute. And he kept laughing. He had a really great sense of humor. And he would, um, you know, the first time he called me, it was to talk about a short story I'd written. And he said, you did this good. And I was like, really? I did? And after about two seconds, he said, John, if I have to repeat myself, over and over again when you do something right. I don't have time for that. Do you want me to correct what's wrong or do you want me to stroke you? I said, no, no, correct what's wrong. And one New Year's Eve, 2015, um, 
he calls and he said, I just read your latest short story. And I have to tell you, you did something that was absolute genius. I said, I'm sorry, Andrew, the phone faded out. Did you repeat that? You did something that's absolute genius. I said, I'm sorry, won't you, John? I am not going to keep telling you that you're a genius. <laughs> I said, okay, what is it? And he goes, and there was a, something based on an incident that happened when I was much younger where these guys had to threaten people. So they walk into the room and they rack the shell into the shotgun chain. And I think I wrote something like, there's no sound that will bring quiet to a room, like a shell getting racked into a shotgun. But then in the next paragraph I wrote, this is obviously done for effect because no professional I know of is going to walk into a room with an unloaded gun. It just doesn't work. And he said to me, never forget this. You simultaneously used and dispelled this Hollywood bullshit about doing that. He said, that was very well done. And I said, I'm glad. He said, no, I, I may even use that at one point. I said, but I'd be honored. And he was honestly, you know, that that's, he would go out of his way. I, I, I tell him things like, I don't think I really write all that well, Andrew. And he, uh, you know, he'd like, you do. Um, the first short story I had published in, a, in, a, in an anthology, he, he went out of his way to call me and tell me that the editor sent him an email about how great I wrote because he said, let's stop this nonsense about you not writing well. Um, he was, you know, the fact that he took the time out, I'll never know what it was about me that made it worth his time. And he never asked me for a damn thing except I knew that he wanted people to continue his work. And I said, you can count on me for as long as I'm around to, to continue this work. I can't be you. Um, as a matter of fact, I corrected somebody who was, you know, the thing about Andrew was he, he was apolitical, absolutely apolitical. He cared about kids. I had people tell me that they claimed he would have been happy with the selection of the Supreme Court justice. He certainly would not have been happy with that. She basically was a defense lawyer and she doesn't believe child pornography is that bad. Um, it is. He's written articles about that. And, I, and we've discussed it personally. We have discussed Supreme Court nominees, he and I, and I knew that he would not have approved of that. So I, I will correct people when they try to insert their politics into what he was doing. One of them said to me, well, you know, you're not Andrew. I said, you're fucking right. I'm not Andrew. No one can ever be Andrew but I'm not going to let you take what you're trying to accomplish and piggyback it off to him. He had plenty to say about how both the Democrats and the Republicans were nothing but bad for child protection. And you can see it if you go back in history. Um, you know, the truth, what we said before we started recording, I think the truth is the truth. Yeah. Back yeah. To what it Re like. re reality is yeah. reality, no matter where it is. Right. Anytime somebody would say, well, the, the left is the party of children. No, it's not. You know, the right is the part. No, it's not. Neither one of them cares. And that's the truth. And he would be able to give specific examples, depending upon what you said. And he stayed true to that. Um, he doesn't doesn't mean you can't care about other things. But with this, you have to be true to it if you're going to be true to it. And, you know, I, I've seen. God. The first, first time we really interacted prior to him reading my first story, he put something up on his website about someone who had done child, her children in some way, or, or might have actually been dogs because he was pro-animal also. Um, matter of fact, he's one of the first person when his clients, the children, would testify, he would have dogs with them to give them comfort. And I wrote to him and I said, if I had this guy, I would hang him up, put it on a Facebook wall. I put him on a meat hook in my basement and use him as a heavy bag. And he writes back to me, John, what good does that do? And, you know, the male ego is a pretty large thing. <laughs> and I looked at that and I'm like, wait a second. Aren't you Andrew Vax? Don't you hate these guys? So I don't understand. And I, what do you mean? Well, what good did you do? You ranted about it, right? 
and that's how he was, man. He would rip the fucking mask off and he would confront you with it. And you had no choice. Um, yeah. Did anything happen positive for children? You could have used that energy and wrote a letter to the prosecutor that you didn't want him to plea out and that you vote. Right. Oh, well, yeah. Well, so what good did you actually do? And damn, if he wasn't right about it. Yeah. And you have the choice. You know, I've, I've had discussions with people. I've had people say things like, um, well, he was wrong about this. Let me ask you a question. Smartest guy I've ever known, most logical, brilliant attorney, actually argued and got custody of a child once before it was born. Um, as an attorney, prior to Roe versus Wade, he tried to have the right for law guardians to have their clients, the children, get abortions when it, they were victims of incest. And that, by the way, was a, an eye opener for me. Uh, John, how do we know they're pregnant? I don't know, Andrew. Uh, the DNA, a blood test? No, John. When they start to show, and a 12 year old doesn't start to show when a father's knocked her up mm -hmm. until maybe four or five months down the line. That was like, okay. And Yes, of abortions that are done, only a small amount are from incest, but there's still enough of it happening that he's handled hundreds of cases like that. If you just look back on his career, um, either he lucked out and hit lotto, but in a very bad way, and this is what he did for thousands of cases, or this is a problem that we have that we're not paying enough attention to. And that's it. Um, you know, we have to say at some point, if we want there to be change, that we have to do something for our children. And there are children, okay? They are our children. And the way I see it, honestly, you as a consenting adult can do whatever you want with another consenting adult. Hell, you can do what you want with several consenting adults. Thinking back to my early days when there was drinking and a lot of girls. As long as everybody's consenting, great. Knock yourselves out. That's nobody's goddamn business what two consenting adults do. But when it's an adult and it's a child, it's everybody's business. And it's got to be evenly applied. Things like this uh, transvestite story hour, you don't have a man dress up as a woman and sexually move around in front of six-year-olds. That is sexualizing a child. OK, and if you're going to say that's not, then what you're actually telling me is your bullshit politics are more important to you than children. Nobody holds their own accountable. You know, if you run with my crew, I'll bet you'll say something simple. I'm there for you. To, similar, rather. You run with my crew, you get into trouble. I'm there for you. I will stand down any odds. Don't let me find out you hurt a kid or a woman. That's not allowed. In my crew. That's not what we do. You know, um, if you can't hold your own accountable, then your cause isn't worth anything. It's that simple. People don't get that. You know, we, uh, we, we live in such polarized times that, I mean, I've been following the, the drag queen story hour for a while now. And it, I remember when it started, I was like, OK, whatever. But fast forward a few years and, and some drag queen uh, shows that, that are being put up now that are are billed as, uh, you know, all ages welcome, have, I mean, yeah. explicit fake breasts, um, uh, simulated sex acts on the stage and that. And yeah, you know, you don't have to tell children. Me, I'm going to interrupt it's you insane. for a second. I mean, people tell me, I'm yeah, sorry. but you know, that's not all of them. And that's the exception. If that's the exception, that would be, that is awesome. It still needs to be called out though. Yes. That's, that's the issue. That's the point. And it's not about, I mean, I've, I've, I've been uh, at places where there was a drag queen performing. I was like, it's not my thing. But, you know, if that makes people happy, by all means, via con Dios, it's your life. But if you bring sexualized acts, whether it's drag queen or anything else, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not for children. You, you can't go into a strip club with kids. It's not allowed uh, un unless there's a state in the U.S. where it is. But I, I very much doubt it um, because they perform sexualized acts in there. Well, the same should apply to anything else, regardless of who does it. And and yes, 
I've, I've talked with people about this and they say, yeah, but you know, you, you, you're looking at the outliers. I'm like, if, if it's, I don't think it's just outliers, outliers. I think it's increasing compared to a few years ago when it started. But even if it is only outliers, you should be on my side and saying like, we need to That's what he's, yes. call this he out. Yes, he should be saying that. Yes, he should be saying to you, you're right. Why isn't he saying you're right? It, it's now, beyond see, that me. speaks of agenda to me. And for me, by the way, this applies to everything. It, it, it's that, it's police brutality, it's, it's racism, it's anything else. It's, yes. there's, there's no sides to pick. If it's wrong for you, it's wrong for me, yes. and vice versa. It shouldn't be, yeah, but you know, my side can do this and not yours. Then you're an asshole who wants power like we, we, we talked about just a little bit ago. Perhaps of all the, <clears throat> the things that he said to me, the most profound, was what you don't understand is everyone's not everyone almost everyone's political ideology is what they feel is in their perceived benefit <laughs> and i thought about that and he said let me come on if trump was what he said he was going to be how many white trash people living in trailers that live on social programs like welfare would probably get a cut if he's what they said he is that are voting for Trump because they don't see themselves that way. It's not part of their self-image. If your ideology, it's, it's uh, look, I have no problem with Democrats. I have no problem with Republicans. I think left of center, center and right of center can always find a way to agree. And I think it's to our detriment that we don't. Okay. But if your ideology, which is what this whole woke thing is, elevates perps over victims. It's flawed. And if you can't stand up and say that's wrong, then you, your cause really doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. People, you know, they don't want to hold their own accountable or there's such a rush to go out and do some good that they don't look to make sure that what they're doing is good. There's no president in my lifetime, including Trump, absolutely not including Biden or Obama, that ever actually did anything meaningful for children. The, the, it, it, they haven't. You know, you want to, uh, well, Trump donated 75. Look, I voted for Trump, okay? But he sucks when it comes to child protection. Sorry, didn't happen, all right? Nothing happened with him. He gave $75 million to something to fight this. He actually endorsed the guy that ended up being a clown. It, it, look, you know, and I'm not saying, of course, People are going to make mistakes like that. But the fact remains, there was nothing meaningful done for children. Certainly, I, I recently looked into the border situation for clients. I've seen bodies of children partially devoured by wild animals or with their throats cut. And what's happening at this porous border to children and women is incredible right now. And everybody's turning their back on it. Yeah. Because if it's my side that's in power, I can't say that they do wrong. Well, then you're, you side, you know... <laughs> What are we talking about? There are kidnappings that are happening in Mexico right now because single people coming over the border might get rejected. And if they grab a couple of kids and say, these are my kids, they got a better chance of staying here. Drugs are, are flowing. There are, there are, there's sex slavery going on. There's people use the term child trafficking. There's labor trafficking is part of that. It's not just sex work. All of this stuff has increased at the border in huge numbers and nobody cares. And that's, well, because it's my side that's in power. It's, it's, a, it's a sign of the times. I mean, the polarization, I've, I've been, I basically stopped publicly talking and writing about this a while ago because uh, the culture war um, is basically has been going on for, for a long time now. And um, I talked about years ago, really like, look, this leads to civil war and revolutions and uprisings, this kind of behavior. We've got thousands of years of history that you can look back to the same things apply uh, for the people who want to look into it, look into the French Revolution. You will see the yeah. parallels are gigantic and, and yes. all revolutions as well. Um, then you have to explain, you know, fourth and fifth generational warfare, which is very different because people say civil war. You, you think there's going to be armies. You don't understand what I'm talking about. The right. point is this, if, if you are stuck in this hyper-polarized mindset, then you will be used by whoever yes. 
is going to pull your strings for their yep. calls. And, and, and they're never going to be front line with you. Oh. They're going to be well protected far back there. And it's and that's, always uh, been like that. And it yeah. will always be the same because you will always have people who will use uh, ideology and mass psychology and so on to get what they want. And, and you know, they say absolute, you know, power cor corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Yes. yes. But the point is that the people who are corruptible are the ones who want power and flock to those positions. It yes. doesn't matter that they're from the left, right, up, down, center. I, I don't care. That, right. that's, that is the biggest issue. It's those who want the power are typically the least suited uh, to wielding it. Yes, and the people that are, are in a rush to be in charge are looking to rule. And, and, and they, they don't understand. People like us do, um, much more so than, than regular people. I don't want to see us killing each other in the streets over politics. And it's, it keeps getting closer and closer to that. When I have a guy that spent most of his career in the military in the Gulf tell me it's almost like we have the Shiites and the Sunnis getting ready to go to war in the U.S. And, and by the way, if the U.S. falls, I don't, I don't see it going well for the world at that point. I don't see uh, if it manages, if they manage to, to actually remove things like freedom of speech and um, I just don't see it working out all that well for humanity. I'm not saying, look, by the way, U.S. has done things that are wrong. Um, there's no question of that. But it, 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 it's going to pave the way for that to be the case everywhere, I think. Um, yeah. The, the thing I often say is that um, when you look at history, I think something like the, the American Constitution is not necessarily, I don't know if it's unique, but it's not that a constitution like that is found everywhere. Right. And I think that's a big, I mean, First Amendment is, is key. Um, and it, it's not something that you have in every single country, the no. way you have it in the US. Now, the way it's being abused and mismanaged, that is something else. But looking at just purely the constitutional matter. Um, but anyway, we're, we're, we're digressing. And I want to get, you know, we want to talk about the book. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay, because otherwise people, people are going to tell me, like, why didn't you ask John about his book? Um, so how did you get started writing it? I mean, what, what triggered you just to write uh, it? Funny thing, I actually wrote a horror novel back in the 90s. I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Kolchak, The Night Stalker with Darren yes, McGavin. Yes, 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 yes. Saw so, so it with my dad when I was a kid. Episode terrified me. Uh, I met a guy when I was working, I was running security for Virgin Atlantic. And um, there was an, a guard who was from India who believed in this mythical creature that was uh, one of the monsters of the week. And he still believed in that. And it inspired me to write about it. And I had this uh, cousin, wonderful lady, Meg. She worked for a publishing house. And I wrote this, it took me three or four hours a day on a typewriter at first. That's how long ago it was. And then a word processor. And I gave her the only copy, the only corrected copy. Well, I later found another one, but I gave her the only copy. She was going to a vacation home in Cape Fear. She called me. She said, the first 60 or 70 pages is rough, but then you found your rhythm. I can help you. We'll rewrite the beginning. It's going to work out. No reason why we wouldn't publish this. And I was like, great. And then several weeks later, I don't hear from her. I call a couple of cousins. You heard from Meg. It turns out while she's in Cape Fear, she has a stroke. Uh, thank God, knock on wood, she ends up being okay. But they cleared out the vacation home she was in, including my manuscript, and that was it. It's gone. So I, that took the wind out of my sails. And years later, when I meet Andrew online, uh, he tells me online that I remind him of someone in one of his stories. And it turns out it's one of the few stories I hadn't read. It was called Mission and Everybody Pays. And he said to me, you remind me of somebody. I wonder what your take on it is. Have you ever read this book? And I was like, no. And he said, well, the library has it. I said, Andrew, I have every other book you've ever written. I can go out and get this one. And it was a huge compliment that he felt I was similar to the character he wrote about in Mission. And that really inspired me. 
to start writing. And I wrote a short story. I put it up on Amazon. You could do that in like two minutes. And I said to him online, Andrew, your, what you said inspired me to start writing. This is what I did. And he doesn't respond. And I am embarrassed <laughs> and I feel like I'm an idiot. And I'm thinking, this is Andrew Vax. So everybody on the friggin' planet has got to do this with the guy. And a day later, he pops up and he's like, wait, you wrote this. I don't have a Kindle, but I'll pick one up. And I said, well, I'd be happy to send it to you. He said, send it to my website. And a few days later, I'm walking out of my house and he calls out of the blue because I lay, my phone number is on my emails. And we just started chatting and I started writing and he would call me and we would discuss what I was writing. And he suggested, he called me and said, uh, this guy, Tom Pluck was his name, is putting together an anthology of short stories to benefit a child protection charity. You should submit your work. And I said, I don't get it because he's your friend. He's going to, he's like, no, he won't put it in if it's not good. And the guy loved the work. You know, he said, look, it was the thing about Andrew. He did not call in favors. He did not network. That was his rule. And the reason people trusted him was because he didn't vary from his rules. Um, he said, if you make it in, it's because of your merit. He said, trust me, you'll make it in. And I, and it just started. The first book that I wrote, Bonds, is not bad. It's a good entry into more traditional crime fiction. Um, and I told him, I just want to write something that's within the confines pretty much of traditional fiction for, for that genre. And I, I, at the end, when I was done, I was happy with it. I think it's a good book. I don't think it's the next Maltese Falcon, but I've certainly bought things and, pay, and read them that I didn't think were as good. Uh, but that's subjective. And several years later, um, I'm a, a, a good friend of mine, Brian Drake, who's a, a prolific author. He's got about a dozen novels uh, out. I had mentioned to his editors at Wolfpack my novel. They took a look at it. Um, and they asked me if they could, you know, if we could, if I'd sign, you know, you know and that, that everybody I know that writes hates my guts. <laughs> it was, it's like, you didn't, you know, I've been sending manuscripts for years and, and I said, well, they, they, you know, they picked me up. Um, I wrote the, I, I had to give them two novels. I did. I'm, I'm pleased with them. I think they're going to do well. I think people are going to enjoy them. Um, like Andrew, I do the best I can to write accurately. So if I write it, it happens, it's happened, or it could happen. Um, I do the best I can to keep it real. A funny story, if we have the time for it. Um, the second book, Sorrows, um, I'm speaking to my editor, who's named James Reasoner. He's written like 400 novels, a legend in the writing industry. And I'm privileged to have this guy as my editor. And I said to him, look, a real PI, if I kill somebody every book, my character does. Um, they'll, even if it's self-defense on video, they are going to ride him out on a rail. They'll, they'll desk a cop if he has a right to shoot. Forget about me or my character. Rather. And he said, look, you can do that if you have something really intense for the reader. Otherwise, you're going to piss off the fans of the genre. You don't want to do that. I said, no, you're right. So while this is happening, if you know Steve Brown? Uh, no. Steve no. W. Brown? He's, he's an Oh, uh, yes, it is. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah, great columnist. Wears a skirt. Yeah, it's not yeah. a kill. It's a skirt, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a skirt. Anyway, he said to me, you ever see this movie called Darker Than Amber? And I said, no. He said, you really should watch it. And I think you'll enjoy it. And it was a Travis McGee novel. And um, Rod Taylor's McGee and William Smith, who we just lost, I think, last summer, who played Conan's father, big bodybuilder guy, martial artist, strong guy, spoke six languages, worked for the CIA. Um, there's this fight that happens at the end of the movie. And my God, it's brutal. Absolutely brutal. I mean, there's, I'm thinking to myself, for a 1970s movie, the fight is realistic. And then I read, guess what? It looks real because it is real. The very first take, Taylor or Smith, one of them slips and breaks the other guy's nose. On the next take, he breaks three of the other guy's ribs. And every time 
the crew yelled cut, the director yelled cut, the crew had to physically separate these guys. And they're two big, strong guys, both amateur boxes. And I'm, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, wow. And all of a sudden, I have this memory way, way back before I started working for Virgin. I'm working for a company in Long Island doing their investigations, 1990, I think it was, or 89. Um, I'm not supposed to be working for any other companies. That was their rule, but I'm bouncing at bars on the weekends because I'm not making enough money. And the guy says to me that I do bouncing for, because you want to make a quick hundred bucks in 1988 or 89. That's a lot of money. I said, yeah, sure. hundred bucks. Yeah. He says, lady's husband beat her up. All you got to do is sit on the couch all night. Um, her brother's coming to pick her up tomorrow and you're done. A ah, hundred bucks. He says, she'll even make you dinner. Oh, I'm there. Now I'm young. I'm in good shape. I'm strong. I do boxing, kickboxing. I lift. I'm strong. Uh, I'm not experienced. And I don't look up and down the block before I go bebopping into this house with my overnight bag. And I don't see the husband who's out of jail sitting in his car. Don't see that. And she's talking to me from the kitchen and I'm in the living room and all of a sudden, the front door fucking explodes off the hinges, split down the middle. And if you saw the door, you know, the behemoth coming in behind, it was like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, got 30, 40 pounds of rock solid muscle on me. Been a gym rat his whole life, a power lifter. And he's, he comes in and he's, I knew you were fucking somebody. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> what you think? <laughs> And she screams, I'm yelling, go call the cops. She runs into the bedroom and we go at it. And later on, I find out that it took the cops seven minutes to get there. And in that seven minutes, he almost choked me out. I tried to take his eye at one point. Uh, he actually literally threw me through a wooden door, a closet door. It wasn't no... Uh, particle board thing he threw me through a wooden door and he went after the wife and i got up and i knew if i didn't stop him he was going to kill her because he was rage incarnate and i remember going to work on his kidneys and the next thing i know i'm on the floor and i'm looking up and the police are coming in and i see blood at first they look down never wear a white shirt it's like when you're in a boxing <laughs> ring never use a white towel Never wear a white dress shirt. And I look down and I look like a fucking Jackson Pollock painting. And um, there's blood everywhere. And everything is all turned over. I try to get up. I fall down. I'm looking up at the ceiling and there's blood on the ceiling. And the cop is, says, stay down, man. And the wife's telling him, that's the guy. He was arrested. He got out of jail. He beat my husband. And I'm listening. And I'm like, whose blood do you think that is? He goes, what's your name? It's my name? And I'm giving him all kinds of, he's like, you got to go to the hospital. And we both went to the hospital. And um, I got out the next morning. I had a concussion. Uh, he was in for three days or so, I think, cuffed to the bed because I got a real good couple of shots in on his kidneys. And he was pissing blood for a while. But that was the toughest hundred dollars I've <laughs> ever earned. <laughs> So what I did with the second book was I took everything that sort of happened in that fight and I made it real for these two characters. And I, I sent it to a bunch of guys and I, I got, you know, guys like us and I got the response back. That was really good. So I'm, I'm looking forward to people's reaction to it. Um, somebody that read it said that that's, that was great. It's like watching a movie. And he's like, that happened, right? Yeah, that happened. <laughs> it wasn't good. No, it wasn't good. I couldn't walk for two weeks. He died around 2012, I think, because he was much older than me. Yeah. Um, I would call her every once in a while just to make sure she was OK. But she actually told me one time and I was didn't understand this. It just reminds me, you know, trying to uh, not, and I never called her again. But him, I would keep tabs on. And he died in like 2012. He was in his I was at the time in my early 20s. He was close to 50. Um, I'm happy that I know for a fact there won't be a rematch anytime soon. You know, that was not a, a pleasant experience. Um, 
And, and, and then just for, for, for the listeners, um, uh, I mean, obviously, I already read John's book, and, and that is one of, one of the things that I have in my notes here, um, is that I really enjoyed that your protagonist uses boxing uh, in, in, in the action scenes, the fights that he has. Um, obviously, you know, I wrote boxing for self-defense. Uh, yes. I love one boxing. One of the things I, I like about you, by the way. It's, well, I've, I've talked about this with many, many, many people uh, who are into martial arts. Look, I've been doing this for 35 years. I've, I've, I've competed full contact. I, I know what, yeah. it's, what it's like to step into a ring or in a cage or on a platform with somebody and they're coming for you. You haven't been punched until you've been punched by a boxer. Yes. You don't understand punching, striking, and, unless you, you, get, you get hit by a boxer. And even if it doesn't look like your karate, kung fu, whatever punch, I don't care. Go to a boxing gym, spend at least yeah. three months training there, then we'll talk. Same yeah. thing applies. Kicking, you haven't been kicked until you've been kicked by a Muay Thai guy. Right. I don't, I don't care. I've, I've, I've done all the other styles myself uh, as well. I, I know all about different, different systems. Yes, go there first, experience that, and then we'll talk. Now, I'm not yeah. saying that's the only way you could kick or punch. I am saying that if you, you haven't experienced it, it's going to be a very difficult lesson for you yes. to learn. So yes. could you talk a little bit about how you see boxing, um, the way it's typically used as a sport, but then you use it for self-defense and in actual real world violence. What is the difference for you? Well, that goes back to my teacher. I, I was very fortunate. Um, my father was killed when we were young. My mother felt we needed something. And she took us to my, my instructor's dojo. Uh, his name was George Smith. And his, his main instructor at the time was Anthony DeSaro. And, and they were the perfect two men to learn from. Smitty grew up in bad neighborhoods. His father was a professional boxer who had over 280 fights when he retired. And Smitty knew how to punch before he could do his homework. And Anthony was this technical genius who could take things out of the katas and actually use them in self-defense, who could relate things and teach and had, and he was by the, and Smitty was a big, strong 6'1", 6'2", 240, 250. And I actually worked the PI job with him and got to see him actually move. You know, we used to do some pretty hairy things together. You want to feel cool, you know, work in the ghetto with your teacher, you know? Um, and, he having him and Anthony was the perfect con, uh, uh, combination, but it was Smitty that taught me that. Um, he, you know, who he's you must know who John Blumen was, right? Yeah, yeah, John Blumen. Yeah, you ever see him hit somebody like it? That's Smitty. He's just, yeah. he, you know, like he would, it looked like, I mean, I actually saw him hit people and. It's like watching somebody do ballet, this big, strong guy. The only flaw he ever had, if I could think of one as a teacher, was he was so good at it that he couldn't understand why people got nervous and upset when they were having real fights. But this is a guy that fought in the street and in the ring and then went to Peter Urban's Chinatown Dojo in New York and learned jujitsu. I mean, this is a guy who did all these things for real, you know, and he was the guy that taught me. And he told me that. He said, there's no hands like a boxer's hands. Mm -hmm. And in New York, if you, <laughs> the way the system, the legal system is set up here, God forbid you have something in your hands when you fight somebody. It's like having a gun. So we would actually take the training further. I mean, it comes a point, let's just say a peekaboo boxer like Mike Tyson, where hitting harder becomes overkill. Pro boxers will tell you that. It can actually be amateurish. It's, different. it's not if you're Ernie Shavers or Mike Tyson or George Foreman, but a lot of different style boxes, you don't have to hit harder than that for what they do. It's a, an accumulation of blows. With him, it's like you got to put the guy down when you hit him. Yeah. Because, if, you know, that's the only way if he's got, you know, and, and, and I'm sure you know, uh, if he has a knife or something like that, you're in trouble. It doesn't matter what you know. It's a huge equalizer. So if you were going to have a chance, you had to have a lot of impact when you hit. And I'm built that way. You know, um, it worked out for me. Um, I was actually training for a fight. Had a date. 
got into a fight with a guy on the way home who, who was screaming at me from his car. And out of anger, I punched his windshield and broke my right hand and knuckles and couldn't take the fight. That was, and boy, was Smitty pissed at me for that. But for a year, I couldn't hit anything with my right hand. So I would throw 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 left hooks at the bag. And it would sometimes take me two hours to do a bag workout with my left hand. In return for that, I've sparred with pros who have told me, you got a left hook on you, boy. That's like nothing I've ever seen. Um, so I, I developed that out of being stupid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the for the most part, look, I... I how do I say it? I, I don't want to uh, look. I, I don't I'm not advocating fighting, especially as I get older. You shouldn't be hitting anybody. But there are things that happen, unfortunately, where you don't have a choice. And with my work, it often made that happen. I worked in a lot of bars. I've worked a lot of protection jobs. Um, I would there were a couple of times when I was young where I've hit people with that. And I was scared that they weren't going to get it up and starting in my thirties, I would no longer hit people with a closed fist. You can generate the same amount of, of force with an open hand, but it's like hitting with a boxing glove as opposed to a ball peen hammer. You know, uh, people have said, no, you don't No, I, I, I hit that hard. Um, I might not be smart, but I could lift heavy things. It's a t-shirt that I have. Um, I've always felt that that was a very important part of self-defense, but you also, you know, boxers train, it has to be adjusted for what we do. Boxers train to hit with taped hands and gloves. We train to hit with bare hands. You know, um, I still do, uh, when I'm not recuperating, I still do push-ups on my knuckles. I still, I've done Makiwara work. Um, you have to, um, oh God, there was a point when I was fighting, when I used to buy pickle grind and soak my hands in pickle <laughs> brine. I'm on, a, I'm on a date with a girl, and she's like, what is that smell? I think it's pickles. I, 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 don't know. Uh, I used to sit there with pickle juice on rags so my skin wouldn't cut, you know? Um, I think boxing is, is essential to your training. Uh, just like you want to do grappling and you want to do kicking, like you said, with people that know what they're doing, you want to be rounded like that. But when it's, you know... I've never hit anybody for real with a spinning back kick. You know, I've had people ask me, what, what did you ever No, It's been a left hook or a straight, right. And that's what get, that's what does the job. It's quick. It's fast. Your hands move at what? 120 miles an hour. Your legs move at 70. If you're kicking somebody in the waist, the shin, the thigh, or the knee, different story. Um, I, I've always been amazed by people that do spinning techniques in front of people that are standing there. Uh, why would you give your back to so I don't, I don't know. Um, but my advantage was I had a guy who trained in boxing. He was a golden gloves guy. And back then amateur boxes were probably on par with some pro fighters today because they were amateur for years and years and years. And the rules were different. And he took that knowledge and he applied it to real fighting. And that that's, how we evolved, you know, the guys that studied under him. Um, as a matter of fact, he's when he, he's 83 now. He was 80. And I'm, I'm driving to my office. I share office space with his son, by coincidence. Great guy, a cosmetic surgeon who was a medical responder at 9-11. Calls me up. And he said, John, John, you got to call my father. You got to go see my father. He said, what's the matter? He'll listen to you. I said, what happened? He said, he knocked the guy out at the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. He's 80 years old. I said, what are you? He's no police would air everything. I had to go. Uh, John, you can't. He, I, I said, can I'll talk to him. So I, I stop off at Smitty's house on my way to work. I knock on the door. And he goes, what did my son call you? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a hard guy. He's got a, you know, his nose is like this little collie scars. What did my son call you? I said, sensei, what's going on? Hey, John, walking into Dunkin' Donuts, guy cursing at his girlfriend. And she's coward. I don't like that. I come out, he smacks it. I said, okay. He says, well, I put the coffee in the donuts down. I told him he was a woman. Otherwise, he'd do that to me. And I said, that would happen. He said, well, then I knocked him out. I said, Sensei, you got a heart condition. You're 80 years old. He said, you're missing the beauty of it. And I'm surprised at you. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, this is New York. If I have a fight with him, he's committing a felony. I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but he's, and he looked at me and he, I said, you know, we need you. I need you. And he said, John, I'm not going to be here forever. Nobody is. And if I die, when I die, I want to be me. So what, how do you, how do you argue with that? You know? So yeah. I went to go, I went to go see Kenny and I said, he, there's nothing we can do, Ken. Just love him while he's here. You know, uh, he was my first real. Uh, there was a. I, I was fortunate. My father was killed when I was young. He was a big influence on me. I learned a lot of things from him. My using my hands was valuable, but not the most valuable. You know, the, no. the, the strong protect the weak. Um, never hurt a woman or a child. You know, stuff like that. That was important to him. So it's important to me. Um, Andrew, who was a huge boxing fan was extremely impressed with him and his father. In his dojo, he had a picture of his father fighting at Madison Square Garden. And you can see the faces in the crowd. And he pointed out James J. Braddock, the guy they made the movie Cinderella Man, who was his father's best friend and frequent sparring partner, mm -hmm. watching him wearing a, a suit and tie with a cane and a top hat. And to show you what kind of man he was and how he grew up. He said, you see that? And there was a man and a woman. You can clearly see them in the picture. He had this huge, beautiful photograph and you can see his dad in the ring. And he said, that's my grandfather. And that's my father looking at my grandfather while my grandfather's at his fight with a hooker and my mother is at home. <laughs> and I said, there goes a, another piece of the puzzle, sensei. I get it. And he goes, yeah, that's, that's what it was like. Um, and his father had something like 280 fights and went all the way to the point where he finally got that title shot. He was in a hotel fire in Florida after he won a fight. Next fight was the championship. He had to go out a third floor window and ruined himself doing that when he landed and couldn't fight no more. Mm. And this was the man that he learned from. And I learned from him. You know, so it, it's, it's you gotta get you gotta be lucky to get the right teachers. Yes. It makes such a difference. It does. Um, let me see. So Bongs comes out January 17th. That's in, yes. in, in three weeks. Up on, and I will, in the show notes, I will put a link to it directly to the page so people can pre-order. You should. Um, yes. And if, if people have that novel, by the way, there is a new short story that hasn't been published that they've included. Uh, okay. The pre-order price, I think, is low. It's $3.49 for a Kindle. Okay. Um, then the next book, Sorrows, is released February 6th, I think, or 7th. And then okay. the third book, which is Harbingers, is released three weeks after that. Okay. And so they're, they're going to assault the public with me uh, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and is there anything you can say at this stage about future books, or is that too soon? Well, uh, no, I, I, I think... Um, I, I'm working on, I was actually working on other things. I, I, I liked, like I said, I thought Bonds was a good novel. I was working on a horror novel, um, which was sort of a blend of crime fiction and horror. And um, that I actually, believe it or not, despite its genre, was more realistic because everybody in the book is broken. And that's much more like real life as I'm getting older and I'm realizing. Um, Hopefully the, the series does well. I hope it does. And they'll continue to publish my books. It is sometimes difficult for me to say I'm a published author when that's what Andrew was. He would yell at me if I said that. I could hear him now, you know, I, and it would, they're not kind words. Um, but it's, uh, it's a way for me. I mean, look, the way that I, my writing is, is I try to bring attention to what happens to children and at the same time entertain people. Uh -huh. So if I can do that, then I've, I've been successful as an author. Plus I made Clint Overland cry. So I did good. I think. <laughs> that, that, that is indeed a mighty achievement. <laughs> well, All right. if uh, I can digress real quick, I'll tell you quickly, Andrew asked me, what, do you, how do you gauge your writing? And I said, if I reach guys like Clint, then I, and he said, good job knowing what he knows, then I've done a good job. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> he did too. Andrew did also. He said that's a very good measuring, uh, measuring stick for that. All right. Um, we are going to wrap up the first part of, of this interview and continue for the Patreon. I've got a, a several <laughs> fun questions for John from my patrons. I can't um, wait. 
<laughs> uh, so like I said, everybody, I'm going to put links in the show notes to the book directly. Uh, you've got uh, Joel's websites, jakeearlyandassociates.com. I'll, I'll put a direct link to that as well. Yes. And so, I'm on uh, Rough Edges Press. My bio is up there. Yep, yep, I didn't all. write that. Uh, my dear friend, <laughs> I didn't write that. All right. My, I have two great friends, Leticia Romero, wonderful woman, PR, and the actor, Patrick Kilpatrick. You know him? Yes. Yes. Patrick, Patrick is going to watch this at some point. He did the setup for the best line in movie history. Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis. I liked it so much I could forgive all of the inaccuracies. He says to Bruce Willis, I guess I'll have to kill you. And there is the setup. And Willis, Willis's character says to him, it'll hurt if I do. <laughs> so nice. I had... Patrick Kilpatrick and Letitia Romero write my author bio, which is on Rough Edges Press. Well, and, 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 and before we go to the Patreon, a quick one. Obviously, I have to say, being Belgian, I have to say that I, I actually only got to know Patrick from uh, the movie he, he did with Jean-Claude Van Damme, where he uh -huh. played the Sandman. Yes. And Mark worked on that movie. Yes, yes, he did. He broke into Kilpatrick's apartment when Kilpatrick <laughs> blocked himself out. <laughs> Probably helped himself to a few things, but we don't know that for sure. We don't know that. There's a story <laughs> about about Mark and Jean Claude that I'll let Mark see another time. I've heard a story. Oh, see, this I didn't know. Oh, that's, that's ask good. ask him. Uh, it it has to do something with a telephone, um, but ask him. <laughs> I will. All right, folks. Uh, so we are going to head into the Patreon uh, part. Anything you want to say to the to the audience in parting words, John? I, I appreciate very much when the opportunity, I am a, a fan of your work. It's an honor for me to be here and I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. I had a great time. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, everybody talk to you next time. Bye-bye.